today I am going to show you how my husband and I recreated this $1,100 Pottery Barn reclaimed wood console table. So first thing we had to do was head to Home Depot, pick up all of our supplies. So we grabbed four of these two by four by eight boards. They were about $8 a piece. They are so expensive right now. We also grabbed four of these two by eight by eight boards that were about $15 each. The wood totaled about $90 for us. We do get a military discount, but it would have been about $110 without that. Much better than that $1,100 price tag of the Pottery Barn piece. Once we got home, we had to cut everything down. So we ended up using the two by fours as the entire frame part of this project. I will show you all the measurements here on the screen in just a second, but if you don't have a chop saw, a miter saw, some type of saw to cut this wood down, you can certainly ask the guys at Home Depot to help you out with the measurements. So for the legs, we cut those down to be 31 inches long. And then we cut down five brace pieces that were 10 inches long. And we also cut down the long frame pieces, which were five feet, five inches long, because the total length of my table is going to be six feet. That is what I'm showing you here. However, we did cut seven inches off of the two of two of the longest five foot by five inch boards because we wanted them to sit inside of the frame. And you'll see that here in a little bit as everything starts to come together. We decided to add pocket holes in to all of the boards because I didn't want to be able to see any of the screws anywhere on this frame. So we have this little Craig jig tool and we just added two pocket holes on both sides of all of the boards that we cut down. My husband was such a great partner during this whole build. He showed me a lot of what to do, how to do things, and then we tag teamed a lot of this work together. Once all of the pocket holes were added, I did sand everything down and I used a 60 and an 80 grit sandpaper for these 2x4 boards. They were extremely rough cut coming from Home Depot. I would suggest sanding everything regardless of how rough the wood looks just to make sure you have a nice smooth surface and a smooth finish. Now it's time to build everything, put it all together. So we ended up using wood glue and two and a half inch long Craig screws to hold the frame together. And that way the screws will hold it in place, but that wood glue is just some added security and will give a really tight bond. We started out building the top of the frame. So we added in three of those 10 inch boards to one of the five foot five inch boards and we added two of the 10 inch boards on both ends and then one directly in the center. Once the three 10 inch boards were added, we then took another five foot five inch board to add on the other side and complete our rectangle for the top of the frame. And we just used our, I was going to say hot glue. <laughs> we used our wood glue and our Craig screws again to hold that in nice and secure. Also using the speed square to make sure that everything is flush and level to each other. Once the top frame was built, we added in the legs doing that same exact process using the speed square to make sure everything was nice and level, adding in the wood glue and then adding in the two and a half inch Craig screws into those pocket holes. Now the inspiration piece only had one top shelf. I wanted my piece to have a second shelf in the middle while well, slightly above the middle. So we measured 15 inches from the bottom of the leg and that was where we were going to add our second shelf. So it was a little bit higher than center. 
And to support that shelf, we're adding in two more of those 10 inch brace pieces on either side in between the two legs. This is where we took off seven inches from two of those five foot boards so that we could add in a brace to the center of that middle shelf. And that way it would just give a little added support for the shelf to sit on. We started out having it sideways and then ended up putting it down flat just the same as the top frame so that it all looked cohesive. And we just added some scrap wood underneath to hold it in place while we screwed everything together. We did the same thing for the very bottom. Um, we only put a brace in the back because I wanted the front to be open. Next, I am taking some plastic wood or wood filler and I'm going to start adding this into all of the areas where the wood meets together. I did not want to see any of these seams. I wanted this to be a seamless piece and look very professional like it came from the factory and like you couldn't even tell where the wood met together. I also wanted to fill in all of those pocket holes. So taking some dowels, I had this variety pack from Walmart and I'm just going to add them in with some wood glue. Add the dowel in and then I'm gonna show you two different methods for cutting these off and getting a nice close cut. First, I am taking this flexible flush cut handsaw. This was a little bit more work, but it got the job done. For the second um, option or method that I'm going to show you, I used a multi-tool and this was a little bit faster, a little bit easier to do, but both options will give you a nice flush cut. And again, I am taking some of that wood filler and adding it in on top of the dowels and the pocket holes because I still want the, this to be a seamless piece and I don't want you to be able to see where those screws held the boards together. Once all of the wood filler was dry, I took some 100 grit sandpaper and I just sanded everything nice and smooth so that when I ran my hand across it, you couldn't feel any bumps. And now we can finally move on to the fun part of painting. So I am using this Rust-Oleum Ultra Cover Semi-Gloss Black Paint along with a short-handled synthetic bristle angled brush um, to get this paint on. I do have a paint sprayer, but honestly, I love painting. I think it is so soothing and relaxing, so I just chose to hand paint this piece. And I went with a semi-gloss here because the inspiration piece was actually made out of metal, but I wanted to get like a somewhat metal-esque look. I know you're still going to be able to tell this is wood, but having that gloss finish is going to help with that overall aesthetic. And I know painting is self-explanatory, so I'm not going to make you watch too much of it. Next up, we are moving on to the shelves. So taking these two by eight by eight boards, we are going to measure them and cut them down. Two are going to be six feet long and two of them are going to be five feet, five inches long, the same as um, the length of the frame itself. Because I wanted the middle shelf to sit in between the frame, we did have to cut one of these boards down um, to be thinner. So it is two and a half inches wide and we just used our table saw to rip this board down. Once the boards were all cut down to size, it was time to distress them and start making them look beat up, antiqued, reclaimed wood, just like that Pottery Barn inspiration. And so we just used all kinds of tools we had laying around the garage. I don't know how to use this thing. It's a, it's a cat knife, so you can chop, you can cut. 
Of course, my husband had to make fun of me a bit because I had no idea how to use this tool at first. And you see me acting so gingerly as if not to hurt the wood, although that's what I was trying to do. So we just started cutting out some gouges here and there, beating it up with another two by four piece of wood. Um, my husband was just trying to think of anything that would naturally beat up wood if it were sitting around on a work site. So he grabbed a cinder block as well, just started rubbing it up and down the boards to add some scratches and some dents and just all kinds of different aging. Or distressing, I guess. <laughs> I think he ended up having a little bit more fun with this than I did. He was going to town beating up these boards and getting out all kinds of different tools to use. In the end, I was actually a little nervous. I didn't think it was going to look that good at first, but once we added the stain, it was perfect. We wanted to brand this piece and my husband has this brand with his initials on it inside of a keystone for Pennsylvania, which is where we live. He actually makes wood flags and he puts this brand on all of his flags. We want to get another one made that has AJ on it for both of our initials since we both worked on this project, but this was the only one that we had for now. After he cleaned that up, you can see how nice and raised this brand looks on the bottom of the shelf. And we put this on one on each of the shelves. Next, we're going to stain and I wanted to pick something that was going to complement the wood floors already in my house. So that's what you saw up in that top picture. I just added a bunch of different stains to this same wood board and we landed on Varathane's Early American. So I started staining both of my or all four of my boards and I gave them two coats of stain and I let them completely dry for a full day in between to really let that stain seep into the wood. And you can really see all of that detail coming out in the wood where we beat it up, dinged it up, all of those scratches and the stain just really settles in there and deepens it up and I just absolutely love the way these turned out. Once the stain was all set, it's time to move on to sealing the boards and I am using this Minwax Polyacrylic. I like the water-based sealers and I'm using clear matte for this with a natural bristled brush. The way I apply sealer is with very thin layers. I don't want to let it pull into those areas where there are some nicks and dings. I put it on very thin and then I'm going to sand it down in between each of the layers. So I put a total of three coats of the poly or polycrylic on my shelves and then I let each layer dry, sanded it down with a 400 grit sandpaper. This is very fine sandpaper. You do not want to add any pressure at all when sanding this. Just rub it along the surface to just get a nice smooth feel and you'll see how it turns white a little bit that's fine that's just from the top coat wipe it away it comes off just fine and then you're going to take another layer of the polyacrylic put another really thin layer on sand it again and then on my third and final layer I do not sand that one and that all just helps to make these tabletop shelves very smooth to the touch. For the base or frame of the table, I am using this Varathane triple thick polyurethane in a clear satin finish. And here you can see just how thick this stuff is, so much thicker than that polyacrylic we used on the shelves. So you really want to make sure to use a very thin coat here. Otherwise you're gonna get like a hazy look to the color and to your project, which is not what we're going for. So I picked a satin finish here because like I said earlier, I wanted this to have that kind of metal-esque look and that satin finish helps achieve that. So for the base, I only end up putting two coats on here because it is so thick. So I put a regular coat on first, sanded, all, sanded it all down with my 400 grit sandpaper, and then I ended up watering down the final coat that I put on and then did not sand that part. Now we can finally attach everything and see it come together. So I am finding all of the centers 
in the areas where I want to add in my screws. And again, I don't want to see any of those screws holding the shelves in place. So we're marking where we want them to go and then we're gonna countersink them. And that way we can put the screw in, hold the shelf together and you won't see anything. Using this Craig pocket bit, um, we just added a piece of painter's tape where we wanted to stop drilling at. And I'm gonna add in a hole right where I made all of my markings where the screws are going to go to hold our shelves in place. Next up, I need to change out my bit so that we can add on our screws and we are using some exterior wood grabber screws here and I end up showing you the wrong side, which is in another language. I will insert a picture of the correct side here. So we're going to place our boards on before we screw them down. We clamp them down um, in place and we use our speed squares to as like a spacer so that there was a little bit of a gap in between each of the boards. And my husband has to help me because I am so weak when it comes to doing things like this, especially upside down. And then for the top shelf, I did want the back of the shelf to be flush against the frame and then the front has a little bit of an overhang. So we added this one in place and that was it for this table, you guys. I am just so proud of what we accomplished. Moving inside before we could bring the table in, I did want to cover up all of those cords that are hanging down from the TV. So I just got this cord cover kit from Home Depot, it's about $16. And I do need to cut it down a little bit because it was too long for where I wanted. I wanted this to sit directly in line and above our outlet. So I just marked off where I needed to cut this down and then I took it out into my garage with my miter box. That's all you need for this one. Just a little handsaw and cut it down really quick. Then we just attached it to the wall and we slid the cover over top. I spared you from seeing my husband actually screw it to wall because he was not wearing a shirt during that part. So high five, go us. Last little step I needed to do was paint this to match our walls. This isn't necessary. It's not going to blend in completely, but I thought it was a nice added detail and made this whole piece or whole area come together. So here's a look at the space before we built the console table. It is just a mismatch of tables that are getting cluttered and I am so overlooking at all of these random pieces in my living room. Yes, you will see some of my DIY projects in here as well. I literally have no more space for anything in my home unless it has a specific area that it is going to. So that is why I created my website, which I will also link below if you are interested in checking it out or buying any of the projects that I make. And here is a look at how the table turned out. I think we did a pretty spot on job duping that Pottery Barn $1,100 console table, but you'll have to let me know in the comments what you think. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth tutorial on how to build a console table. And that's all I got for you today, friends. I'll see you in the next one.